Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, and you're welcome to the very first, the inaugural Kisima Dialogue. Um, we are excited to have this dialogue this afternoon. It, like I said, it's our very first, and the main point of it is to introduce, reintroduce um, Kisima, to say we have been working, we did um, launch Kisima and said we will be doing the work. Now we are saying the work has started. So we are online, we are working, we are on the ground, and we're excited to share this with everybody that's joining us online. Uh, my name is Mapaseka Kweli. I am a media and a, oh, yeah, media consultant for Kisima, media and communications consultant for, Kisima, for Capsi, and I work on Kisima. I focus on Kisima. Kisima is actually my name. So this is a project that is very, very close to my heart and one that I'm very excited um, to be part of. We will be going through the afternoon just to make us understand clearer what we've been doing in the past few months, but also looking, you know, the whole topic for today is we're looking at the do's and don'ts of uh, philanthropy. And we'll also be launching the uh, side of the apps. We've got a iOS app and we've got Android apps that will be launched, which is exciting. We've also got our partners who are joining us and we thank them for joining us for being part of this, um, for this afternoon. And they will be uh, speaking to us and also sharing with us um, and explaining our nominations, uh, how those can, so we're also launching the part where we can nominate, um, where we can nominate a partner, uh, nominate somebody in an organization to join us, to be, you know, to, that we can run with and we help with fundraising as we go on. And uh, this is all part of what Kisima aims to do. Remember, Kisima is a threefold project. And the first part is a story, a story repository, which is what we've got on our site. So if you go to our website, that's what you've got there, the stories from different um, parts of the country, uh, of, the, of the continent. And in fact, that's the most important part about Kisima, the fact that it's actually continental. Um, and the focus is to say that Africans are standing up and doing the work and Africans are making it a point to help those around them. This is obviously made even clearer um, after what we've seen with COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, after, after that, it became even clearer that the help of Africans is actually within Africans. And this is why it has become so important for Kisima to be part of our everyday um, conversations are everyday life and, and the community philanthropy that we are seeing around the continent has become a very integral part of who we are as Africans. Now, I would like to first welcome, um, to, to welcome us and introduce to us the synopsis of what we'll be doing for the day, to please introduce Professor Peggy Moyle, who is a director um, of the Center of African Philanthropy and Social Investment, which is CAPSI, which houses Kisima. Uh, he's a writer and author, researcher, and thought leader, and he's championed the African discourse on philanthropy and contributor to the growth of many African, African civil society formations. Uh, it is an absolute pleasure to have him join us. Uh, Prof, you are not well, you are on. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mapasega. Good morning, good afternoon, and evening to everyone. Uh, this is now standard greetings because we are doing this online and we never know where others are. I'm really excited to welcome everyone uh, to this event, the Kisima event. Um, I'm also excited about the potential of this project. Uh, this project started um, as a research initiative in response to COVID-19. Uh, we were very uh, interested in exploring the impact that COVID-19 had on philanthropy, uh, social investment and the nonprofit sector in general. And as many of you would have known by now, they, there's various research that has demonstrated the extent to which uh, the devastating effects of COVID has had on, 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 on all of these sectors. Uh, but we are also equally interested to know what has been the response uh, of these sectors to the pandemic. And we also know today through various research projects, including our own, uh, how these various sectors responded in order to mitigate the effects of COVID-19. Prior to the uh, research project, uh, we had uh, a year before uh, explored what was the impact of the, the fourth industrial revolution on civil society foundations and philanthropy. 
and our findings then it uh, given us an you know a, a glimpse of what most of these sectors thought about the industrial revolution the use of technology uh, and not many were prepared not many even thought that this is an issue for them to worry about they had not budgeted for an eventuality where they could move online work remotely among others and then covid happened what was the response so we were very interested to to actually go out into the field understand you know what the impact has been but also what have been the responses our findings suggested that a lot was happening in the space of philanthropy uh, communities were giving in big numbers not just financially to each other in kind uh, they were giving in goods they kept communities going amid the challenges of covid 19. we also picked up that companies were also giving across the continent uh, so they were not just giving, you know, in small numbers. I mean, they were speaking; they were giving in big numbers, and and we have documented the data to show how that was happening. Foundations were also giving; some of them even progressively so. Uh, but the spotlight, for some reason, was on international forms of giving, and not on the local forms, especially the first responders. We all know that when a crisis, a pandemic, a natural disaster happens in most communities it is the community members that respond first but the spotlight is never on them the spotlight is on the international actors who then come in with all the machinery the infrastructure that comes along with some communication uh, elements to it and so we wanted to 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 create an initiative that would spotlight and showcase local responses and giving uh, not just during the a crisis like covid but generally in other words, we wanted to make sure that we are reversing the narrative on giving. We are reversing the narrative on philanthropy in Africa. And so we wanted to collect, we wanted to collect as many stories as possible in an easily accessible format. And I think when the colleagues come in to explain how the, uh, the, the site works or the app works, you will begin to understand how we are collecting these stories. We want to make it um, easy but what but we also want to give people an opportunity to curate the stories in their own format and in their own ways in their in their own liking without us always curating them for the stories for them but beyond showcasing stories we also wanted to demonstrate that africans and their counterparts give hence the second element or the dimension of kisima is about is about an, an a campaign uh, or a fund and uh, we are going to be using today's uh, convening to begin the process uh, of inviting nominations for causes that will be supported. And I think as you will go through the site and the, and, and, and the discussion today, especially the stories that uh, we'll be showcasing, you begin to understand the third component of the site, which is that we want to understand what is the impact of all this giving? What is the impact of philanthropy on our communities and development uh, on social cohesion, among others. And so some of the stories that you will listen to today are beginning to tell us uh, in, in a different way uh, uh, of, of what the impact is. We are used to log frames most of the times, but storytelling is, an, is another powerful way to demonstrate impact. And for us, the Kisima is actually that well that we, should, we want to go to, to, to actually quest our, our, our test. So while today we are using the opportunity to listen to a few stories that we have profiled so far, launch the, the app, the iOS and the Android version of the site, I'm also happy to say that we have finally um, uh, finalized arrangements with our partner Trust Africa to activate the fund. And hence, uh, like I said, we'll begin the process of nominations for causes that will be supported. I know my colleague Briggs from Trust Africa is here. He will talk about what Trust Africa does in the space of philanthropy. But our partnership with Trust Africa goes a long way back. Uh, we actually work jointly on, on research, on convenings. And for this sp uh, specific initiative, we are going to work with Trust Africa to manage the finances on behalf of CAPSI. So they will actually be a fiscal sponsor for the work that we are doing. And for us, this is a very good way to demonstrate collaboration but to also be as far wide as possible, especially in terms of geographic reach. So I want to um, uh, really thank everyone for, for coming through, but in particular, 
I want to thank the story uh, tellers, the people behind the stories uh, who are here with us today. I want to thank our patrons, um, um, Mrs. Krasa Marshall, John Gengasong from the CDC, uh, as well as Mam Judy Lamini, who is joining us today. Uh, she is not just our patron, but she is also the chancellor of the university. I also want to thank our partners, um, the Open Society Foundations in Africa, uh, the Mort Foundation, and all other donors that support our work and make it possible for us to integrate Kisima into our work of CAPSI. And of course, finally, this would not have happened without the, the, the CAPSI team. And I really want to um, you know, uh, thank each and every member of CAPSI for believing in some of the work that we do and pushing some of these narratives. Uh, so I would hand it back to you, Mapaseka, and, uh, and, and, and get back later to uh, maybe do more logistical uh, announcements and thanks to some of the partners that I might have missed here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. And uh, as we move on with our program, as Prof has as, as, uh, stated, one of our patrons is Dr. Judy Lamini, and she is um, the Vice Chancellor of uh, the University as well. And it is an absolute pleasure to have her join us um, on the line to give us a keynote address. Dr. Judy, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Mapaseka. Um, uh, the director of the Center on African Philanthropy and Social Investment, Professor Beginko C. Moyo, CAPSI and Kisima team, the trust fund uh, members that are with us on this call, the other patrons, Mrs. Grasa, Michelle, and John Kegasong, all the donors uh, that are here on the call and physically there. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, bonjo, habari, chana muema, sani bonani. It's a true honor to be part of the inaugural uh, Kisima quarterly dialogue. It's a true honor to be part of Kisima. Uh, congratulations on this very important initiative and the launch of the mobile app. We thank uh, Prof Moyo for his leadership and all the donors that have made it possible for us to be here. Thanks for bringing back storytelling, which is captured for generations. Our offspring will enjoy what we missed, which is stories told by our forebears in their voices with their faces captured. The beauty of technology used to revive a culture that we are so proud of. We'll never know what they said because it wasn't written, but with this, we'll be able to know people that lived well before our time, at least our grandkids will. Thanks for highlighting our history of giving. Giving because it's the right thing to do. Giving without expecting anything in return. Giving privately to respect the dignity of those that receive the help. Giving not only what we have, but what we know and who we know through networking. When I listened to the videos on the website, I liked Nelson Magamo's uh, definition of success, namely that success is the ability to contribute to your community. He continues and says, giving is for making a difference and passing it forward, not giving for a show on social media. I thought instead of talking about the different documented studies on giving as we celebrate uh, our inaugural dialogue, uh, the do's and don'ts that you will find when you search in the web, I'll share my own lessons on giving. Storytelling is about telling our stories and I want to remain true to what Kisima is trying to achieve by doing just that. I'll share the things I've learned over time. The word philanthropy is foreign to your typical African because giving to us has always been part of being. It didn't have a name. It wasn't a standalone concept. It was part of our DNA. I remember as a child, my mother used to give to her, of her time and expertise. She was a primary school teacher and at night she would teach domestic workers how to read and write and ba basic arithmetic. On some days she would ask me to come with her and teach. 
I would have been around eight or nine. The impact was real. You would hear someone say, I couldn't read. Now I can read my own letters and write my own letters. No one can cheat me anymore because I can now count my change. There is no better return than that positive change on people's lives. As I grew up and I was now at medical school, I remember a friend of ours who had discovered a school in town where township kids who had failed metric exam were working on improving their subjects before they do the rewrite. We were all good at maths as medical students. So he would take us with him in a bus to go and teach uh, the kids maths. These kids were obviously of similar age as us because we're in first or second year and they just failed matric. No one sponsored our bus fare. We just took from the little pocket money that we had and went to try and make a positive difference and didn't think much of it. It was a way of being. That was Dr. Norman Sibula, who contracted COVID at the end of last year because he chose to go and help out in hospitals at the peak of COVID. Sadly, he succumbed to it. May his soul rest in peace. Giving was his way of being. Giving for me and my family has been part of our DNA too. Our focus has been on education and rural development. In the process of giving, we've learned valuable lessons, starting with the bursaries that we offer. Our take has been influenced by our own journeys as students. When I was at medical school again, I failed second year and lost my bursary, which made it very difficult for my mother who was the only remaining parent by the time I went to medical school. Though it was tough, I did become a doctor eventually. This personal journey made me not to withdraw funding when a student fails one or two causes. That, and, and that has paid dividends, just giving people that extra time and that extra funding. When I now look at the students that you've supported over time, who are now responsible and productive citizens of the country, it makes it all worth it. There is no better return than that. Education has a multiplier effect. If I had to choose just one thing to give towards, it would be education. Lesson learned from this experience, don't give up too soon on people. Always consider their background and the psychosocial support that they may require over and above money. Staying with education with a rural focus because of the higher need in those areas. We adopted a primary school in our ancestral farm, which is very rural and impoverished in KZN. My husband's grandfather donated land and also assisted with building of the school back in the 50s. When we got involved in the 90s, we assisted in the building of the computer lab and kitting it out. We felt really good about ourselves. We're doing something. Soon enough, we discovered that not much was happening in this lab. To cut a long story short, we decided to hire a computer instructor who runs computer lessons every day for different grades. So now they're scheduling for each grade to have their turn to go and learn and work on the computers rather than just computers being covered uh, for no use by anyone. We got maths and English programs that the learners use where their progress can be measured and they can be ranked against other schools who use the same program. What we learned is that to have an impact, you have to stay close to the projects that you support fully understand and support their needs and be able to measure impact. While we wanted to replicate this initiative in the neighboring high school to ensure that there's continued success of the students that are produced by the primary school, we failed. The leader of the school was not interested. We learned the importance of leadership as everyone in this room will know. It is a make or break in any setting, leadership that is. Leaders that are there to serve, leaders that care for their people and the people that they need and take pride in the success of their organizations is what makes a difference between successful organizations and those that don't grow and eventually fade. 
In schools, it is said that leaders like that continue without recourse, except the destruction of our children, their future and their communities. Investing in the leaders in education at all levels is critical for the successful quality education and the prosperity of communities. Another lesson learned was that you can't impose your help. Never throw good money after bed. When you realize that there isn't good leadership to take the cause forward, then just remove your resources because they can be better served elsewhere. In the same rural community, we engage with the community to understand their needs. People from cities who happen to be us are notorious for imposing their wishes on rural communities without taking the time to understand what these communities actually need. Understanding this, we took a year consulting with the community and we were clear that we are all aligned. After building a hall for community skills training, for hosting monthly mobile clinic and local events, we were further we went further pay agreement. We brought, in, we brought in a reputable company that gave the community practical training on arts and crafts, budgeting and pricing of products made. The, the objective was to create small entrepreneurs who were trained to, pro, to, to produce a product, price it and sell it with help. This was very exciting. The community produced this beautiful arts and crafts and we got young entrepreneurs who bought the products, added a markup, and sold to retail stores. The team shared the money that was made, but it only worked for a year. Then the committee was not happy. They wanted to be paid for coming to work, whether they produced anything or not, whether the products were sold or not. Lesson learned, as a country, we've created a culture of takers who think the government and any philanthropist owe them a living. Social grants, while they help, they also create a culture of entitlement. We need to build back that human dignity and pride, the culture of people understanding that they are the masters of their own destiny. I truly believe that this issue is very important and requires a national drive to address it. There's a lot of healing that we need as a country. Our apartheid past was most damaging to the mind and believing in self for the majority. To quote Stephen Bantubonkebigo, I quote, the most pot potent weapon of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed, close quote. Storytelling of people rising from poverty and making something of their lives is one way of building back this dignity, showing Africans giving to causes and just reminding the African child of their power and their dignity is very important. Going back to Nelson McGannmo's story that is on the website, he talks about art th uh, therapy that he used to help Ebola survivors to tell their stories and in the process heal. We need to heal our minds to build back our power and our dignity. One other thought that resonates with me is that shared by one of the fathers of Africa, President Julius Nyerere, who said, I quote, a man is developing himself when he grows or earns enough to provide decent conditions for himself and his family. He's not being developed if someone gives him these things, close quote. In order for our giving to be sustainable and enable Africa to thrive, it has to develop the African to self-sustenance, if nothing else. Our giving needs to ensure that Africa rises. The last thing that I believe is important is the why. Why do you give? Understanding the why has helped me when I got frustrated in the process of giving and almost gave up on the project. What has sustained me is understanding the desired outcome and the difference it would make. That would make me start again and try another way of making sure that the desired outcome is indeed achieved. In a country that is the most unequal in the world and a continent with so many needs, giving is not an option. So understanding the why is important. Do you give for the show? Do you give to cleanse guilt? Or do you give because you want to make a positive difference? 
none of it is wrong, but understanding why is key. Where giving is for a show, my prayer is that those that receive have intentions that are bigger than themselves and their acts lead to sustainable development, which is where the vetting of the projects and the recipients by the Kisima has put in place uh, for the fund is very important. And I really applaud you for doing that. The three-prong approach of the Kisima initiative as alluded to by uh, the, the Professor Moyo uh, is very important sharing good stories of giving. And I like that people tell their stories themselves, their way, they are not curated. That's how we did it. That's how we grew up. And that's how our forebears used to tell them. So you're bringing back what we know, what we can relate to, what is part of our culture, but you're putting it on a platform so that it withstands the test of time so that it can be shared and passed on through generations. And people that may not know you, not in the same room as you will still have access to your stories and feel better about themselves and learn from you just by checking the platform and looking at the stories. It is my prayer that through stories, we build back African dignity, we heal the mind and remind Africans of who they are and what they are capable of individually and collectively. Congratulations, Hongera. Allah, Allah. May Africa prosper from this initiative. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Julie. Thank you so much for the beautiful words. And in actual fact, when you said the why is what becomes most important for you, that resonates with me so much because the number of people that I've spoken to on the Kisima travels, when we are talking to different um, organizations, different individuals who are going out to make sure that their communities um, and getting better or improvement in terms of the work that we do, it's always the why. It's always giving back because they see and they have seen and they have lived in a space where they know the needs. And it, it actually ties so well with the dreams and goals of, of philanthropy, which is our theme for this dialogue. And the main point of the journey is to say, as you are giving, Remember, Africa does it differently. In Africa, excuse me. In Africa, as we give, we tell the stories. And we give because it is, this is who we are. Ubuntu is part of who we are. We are, I am because you are. And uh, it is shown and seen so much in a lot of the stories that we give up and a lot of the work that, that is there, uh, that is done in the African continent as a whole. I'd like to introduce our next speaker to join us, uh, and she will be talking about freedom uh, within philanthropy. South Africa celebrated Freedom Day just yesterday, and uh, I think it makes so much sense to have this talk on freedom within philanthropy. As much as we are giving, those that we give to do have freedom, and they are allowed to be who they are and they decide who they want to be. Please put your hands together for Tandy Mahabe. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tandy Mokbele, and thank you so much for this opportunity to present to you today on philanthropy and freedom. Um, oh, philanthropy within freedom, as Mama Seba puts it. I'm going to share a little bit on philanthropy and uh, Freedom under the nexus of uh, human rights, and the reason why we decided to link philanthropy and freedom today is because South Africa is coming uh, from a day of celebration, which was yesterday, celebrating Freedom Day, uh, which commemorates the first uh, democratic election since um, Paul Post's uh, pre apartheid, uh, the first 
elections took place in 1994. So we're celebrating that yesterday. So we want to see what does it mean for freedom and philanthropy in the African continent. Even that um, it's not just South Africa celebrating freedom of democracy, but uh, all African um, African countries in the continent uh, have gone through uh, colonialism and have a sort of a way of um, celebrating freedom. I think Leto is controlling my slides. So if we can move to the second slide, please. Um, as I've mentioned that I'm gonna start with um, explaining a little bit about philanthropy and, and, and freedom under the human rights and perspective. Um, we know that the world adhered to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which entitles everyone to their right and freedom. And in this case, um, some countries or some places, even within South Africa, may fall short of this freedom, especially the freedom of right. And I think that's where philanthropy comes in, where there's want and people are not able to um, move freely or express themselves freely. And you would think because we're in a democracy, some of these things would be a given, but there's still issues with um, some of those freedoms being um, achieved by some of the people of Rosen in the continent and in South Africa as well. So, uh, so philanthropy, I think, particularly uh, the civil society have been willing to advocate for, for human rights and um, fund humanitarian projects. And this is their way of um, assisting those people who are not able to achieve these freedoms and human rights. Uh, if we can move to the next slide. Uh, in my introduction, I've already touched on uh, South Africa and what, how South Africa got to celebrate Freedom Day, uh, which is um, what it was yesterday. But what I really want to talk about is how philanthropy has actually um, assisted South Africa pre-democracy. Um, we know very well that some of the songs that we sing were collaborations of uh, artists um, who, who were fighting for South Africa's freedom through music and other artistic ways. We have the civil society also uh, fighting for freedom, um, working in collaborations with some of the groups uh, anti apartheid groups in the country. And um, also on, on top of this, we also had foundations at FLD, the Foundation of the Ford Foundation, who work with South Africa, uh, South, anti, -South, anti apartheid groups uh, in South Africa, focusing on laws of the country, um, assisting, assisting um, uh, groups in, in terms of law and protecting human rights. So Ford Foundation continues to assist uh, South Africa with uh, education and other forms of, of philanthropy in the country, but they have been active on, on assisting South Africa to achieve the freedom that we have today. Okay, can move to the next slide. So how do we define philanthropy and freedom? Um, I've, I've got a few definitions there, which I think the easiest or simplest way, I would say, is the ease of giving. And I think uh, Dr. Judy's introduction touched on this, so she kind of summarized this, that the freedom to give, to give whenever, whoever you want, and for whatever cost that you need. Um, so this also would be your time, it could be money, um, and other resources that people uh, give for charity. So to re-emphasize uh, freedom and philanthropy, um, I'll say that we see this on, on, on the Kisima platform, 
that these people that we see are, are posting their stories of giving, they are free to do so. They are free to give. It's not a government initiative, but it's something that um, they have chosen to give to. Could be because they saw there's a want, or they want to upgrade a certain particular person, or take someone to school, or just help a community member with something. So that what gives them the freedom to move to give without um, any restrictions. So uh, going back to the human rights perspective, so this shows you that irrespective of your location status, uh, anyone can lend a helping hand. We can move to the next slide. Okay, so this is just to expand on uh, philanthropy, um, where this philanthropy is also freedom. Um, on the final point, this addresses that um, freedom of individuals to direct their gift wherever if they see fit. Um, in recent years, we've also seen that um, a lot of philanthropy has also gone into uh, development and economic projects, economic development projects. And you might wonder, but how is this linked to freedom or human rights? Uh, but we all understand and we've seen that in the continent, there's a lot of poverty. And sometimes before you even go into the route of giving someone the right to speak or the right um, to assemble or other rights, you know that you need to tackle uh, poverty issues. And that's why you see a lot of philanthropists, they would not say that we are fighting human rights or freedom. But this comes in a, in a form of economic development, uh, education, funding education, health. Um, and I've seen on, on two on the Kisima platform, uh, two of the stories uh, in South Africa highlighting education uh, is the Imbo Koto Launchpad and also the Bridging the Gap for Youth Empowerment, which is in, basically in Bobo. And as you go through the website, you can see the other stories. I think there was one in Nigeria, and I think Uganda also, uh, it focuses on education. So in that sense, um, they're giving someone freedom to choose, uh, to learn, to choose to be educated. Um, and that's how you, you bring about freedom, because one day they're going to use that to, to support other people uh, achieve their own freedoms and human rights. Um, if I can go back to South Africa, human um, education and health are one of the basic uh, human rights in the country. So that's why you see how we can link philanthropy, freedom, and education and health. We can move to the next slide. Uh, so the takeaway on, on this small presentation um, is that Philanthropic freedom is not universal, and that's something that we all want to achieve. I think that's why we're also trying to um, have people deposit their stories onto this platform so that people can see what's happening. And in countries where it's not easy to use an NGO without a political interference, um, that's still something that we need to still, as, as a philanthropy um, sector, we still need to, to strive for. Um, there's also an agent need to create spaces in which philanthropists can freely operate. So this talks to the first point that we need to make sure that philanthropy is flexible, accessible in every in every part of Africa uh, without any political interference, because it's a right um, for everyone to be able to give and receive without uh, government interference. And as we continue to celebrate um, freedom across Africa, um, we need to also remember that we need to move forward as a society and not focus on what could have been. Um, as I've said, that South Africa come from an era of apartheid, which has been what, decades now, Let's, yeah. <laughs> uh, since then. But we need to move forward and see how we can assist each other. And I think. The Kisima platform is just one way of saying that there are people who don't even consider themselves philanthropists because they just do this 
out of the little that they have. Um, but that is philanthropy, and I think that's why uh, Prof Moyo and other philanthropic scholars are trying to redefine philanthropy, not to just talk about what foundations, the Bill Gates, but everybody who lends a hand to help everybody um, will be able to, to move the countries forward or, or whatever communities that they're trying to uplift through philanthropy. And to end this, I have a, there's a song saying that says, uh, um, so a hand washes uh, the other. And I think that's what we've been trying to do. If you try to wash your hands using just one hand, I, I don't think you'll be able to clean yourself. So we need to continue to wash each other's hands so that we can move our societies forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tandi. Tandi is uh, with us at CAPSI, and she is a program manager uh, at CAPSI, and she is working with us and trying very hard to get us to all do the right thing. We, and I thank Prof, um, Prof Moyo for getting her to stand up and speak um, of this um, freedom within philanthropy. Now, as, as we continue, I'm going to take you through the site and show you exactly what the website um, looks like. If you see my giving.org website, it looks like, and I want everybody to be able to go back and just go through it and just play around on the site and see what we've got there. It's an exciting site um, and one that, you know, we keep adding to on a daily basis. Um, a very interesting one in that the, the people that we've got on the site, so the organizations that we've got on the site, some have, some were, well, we went to and we approached to say, your story is amazing, please can you share part of your story on our platform. And some of the stories were actually deposited on the site. And that's the most important thing about the actual site, and that we want applicants to be able to tell their stories from wherever they are. So as you sit in whichever country that you sit in, you are able to get to then go online and share with us, um, it says something, there's a little tab that says submit a story. And you can submit your story there and share exactly what you're doing, how you're doing it, and where you're doing it. And in that way, we are able to get it in any format that you would like to share. So we are taking stories in video format. We are looking at text. We are looking at photographs, YouTube, or how, whatever format works best for you and is easiest for you to post your story. That's the format that we will use. We do that because it makes it even easier um, to understand and to navigate. You know, when you tell your story, the, the very way that you want to tell your story. This is how we go on and we inspire others. I did say that the first part of the site is the fund, and that's the story with the, the, the story repository, and this is where we are putting in the stories and making sure that they are on the site, they live on the site, they are a reference point for anybody, and this is before the fund, the repository that I mentioned. Um, and this is where they, the, the stories sit on the site as a standing, memorabilia for anybody in the world to be able to join and see exactly what Africans are doing. Your story may be in whichever country that you are in. You may be sitting in Uganda and we should be able to see it everywhere else in the world. That's the important part. That's the first part of, um, of, the, story, of, of the site. And then when we look at the second part of, of the site now, which is very important to what we are launching today. This is the fund that we are talking about. Now, as Prof Moyo alluded to earlier on, we will be launching today. Uh, we are launching today um, the nominations. You know, it's a call for nominations where you can actually nominate somebody, you can nominate yourself. And this is how the fund comes in. In this sense, you are then able to say, this is the story, this is who I am, and this is what I provide, or this is the person that I am seeing uh, who is providing these services to their community, this is why I think they are, they deserve to be, um, to be helped with funding. We then will go in, and of course, there will be checks and balances where, for, for governance purposes, to make sure that um, everybody meets their requirements. But, you know, just making sure that as we introduce Kasima to the, to the world, we also are saying, your story can go online, and then we then go back and we sit back, and once a story is true, once an initiative is chosen to be part of um, 
our fundraising. We will then start them with fundraising and uh, they will then be given an amount of time to work with the funds that uh, as they have been received. And you will see as we go on with, uh, with, with today's proceedings that we've got a presentation that will show you exactly how a payment gateway works, where you can also deposit um, or if you choose to, you know, to give to any of the funds that we, that we will be running with, we can give money there and we will see later on um, as, as well as and uh, Charles will present and show you exactly how um, how they would go about doing that. So when we look at the site itself, it's it's more an inspiration for the world to say Africa is doing the things. That's the third part of the Kisima initiative is where we then come back, and this will be probably a year after we have um, we have been running a fund to come back and, and report back to say these are your funds. This is how much you have put in. This is where it has gone to, and this is what has been done with those funds. It is a very important part of, of, of any practice to say if you are going to be giving funds, you've got to know exactly where your funds are going and what is being done with those funds. All of this is part of this site. I want us to go through and just go to, if you go to the stories, please get to. Um, I want us to just look at some of the stories that we've got there. Uh, for example, go to go to South Africa. And I'm just saying South Africa because this is very hard. Okay, the first one that comes up is bridging the cap, uh, bridging the gap empowerment youth foundation. This is a very interesting initiative by very um, very interesting initiative by very young South Africans who have made it their point to say they know that when they went to university, they were struggling in terms of career guidance. They were struggling with what careers to go who to talk to, how do I apply for university, how do I even, how do I even get network and, and start working with um, universities and talking to other people about it. So where do I go, where do I start? And they are bridging this gap. This is an empowerment fund, very interesting. So there's more stories that are on the front door, oh, please make sure. Um, that's Youth for Survival, and uh, there's also a very interesting story in uh, in Pretoria, um, Pretoria, South Africa, also looking at some of the work that they are doing, helping uh, women and helping the youth. And they go as far as helping, in fact, they've got a little crash that they run in, as part of their initiative. And they run the crash because the women that they take care of come there and they are running away because they have been abused, because there has been obviously problems and issues. They have housed these women and they say to them, when you come with your child, there is no time for you to stop and say, what happens to my child when I am for pregnant? And this is how the question comes up. So these are just some of the stories that we have on the site. Kito Lisey, and you'll hear more about Kito Lisey because uh, Namaki is here and she will be telling us more about Kito Lisey just short because I'm not even going to go into Kito Lisey. But there is so much more that I, that I want us to look at when you go to when you go to the site itself. Thank you, Kito, for the stories. Um, so when you go back to the site and you try and, and, and you look at the campaigns, this is where we will then be putting together those campaigns and say, these are the campaigns that have been nominated, this is who you can find. And then you start running with those campaigns and you can then donate to a foundation, to, to a campaign of your choice. So these are but some of the things that I'd like you, I'd really, really encourage you to please go and sit on the site and just play with it. And just play on the site and see the number of things that you that you have on the site. Very, very interesting stuff. All right, and we go on with um, I'd actually like to ask Charles to join us now. Who will be yeah, Charles will be going through the payment gateway on the site? I did speak a well, little a little bit to the payment gateway, talking about you know how you then get to uh, make payments or make donations to um, whatever initiative that you choose. There is so many, so these are people that are in the background and that are running with us to say, this is the work that needs to be done. We are doing the work not only for ourselves as a center, but this is for Africa. Charles, go ahead. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm actually going to be uh, going through the, the mobile app. Um, uh, my other colleague, our other colleague, uh, Oswald is on, who will be going through the payment gateway. Um, yeah, so 
I won't take uh, too much time on the mobile app uh, as it's uh, just like uh, pretty much a mirror image of the, of the website. Um, so the, in terms of functionality, both functionality and uh, the content on the, on the app, uh, both are, are just uh, mirroring the, the, the website. Um, yeah, so, so this is uh, the, the mobile app, how it will look on Android, how, how it looks on Android and uh, iOS. Um, so the stories are pretty much the same ones, are pretty much actually exactly the same ones that are, that are on the website. Um, so just, uh, yeah, that's uh, the girls lead uh, essay story. And um, yeah, I'll just uh, also show a couple of other stories. So the app will be available for download. Um, it's still just going through a, a few approvals on, on Google Play Store and, and the iOS App Store, but it will be available for download, hopefully uh, early, early next week or um, yeah, that's, 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 that's when it should be available for download. So yeah, that, that's, uh, that's pretty much all on the app. I'm not gonna dwell too much on it because um, yeah, as I mentioned, in terms of functionality and also content, it's exactly like the website. Um, thank you. All right, that's Charles. Thank you very much, Charles, uh, for taking us through those apps. Now, you know, the importance of having apps is we, we, we work on our mobiles. So we sit on our phones and we sit on our iPads all the time, everywhere we are. So accessibility, for accessibility purposes, this is why we thought it was very important for us to have this app. Um, so that it's easy to get in and just connect and see exactly what is happening on the site. And uh, let me then forward to Oswald, who will then be presenting the theme of Gateway. Oswald. Uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, I trust you're all doing great. Uh, if you can just play the video, please. So basically, we've been quite busy trying to make sure that we can facilitate the connect the collection of the donations coming from different individuals across the world. And uh, aligned to the global trends, we have tried to make sure that uh, when someone follows a campaign, is interested in a campaign, they can easily be able to donate some funds to back that campaign. And what we've done in the back end is we've integrated with multiple payment channels that enable individuals in different jurisdictions to be able to put up all their details, uh, similar to our experience on any other e-commerce platform, be able to play through the Kisima payment gateway, which accepts all credit cards, debit cards, and also PayPal. And uh, we've actually gone a, a bit further to include cryptocurrencies based on encouragement from Prof, who always wants to lead in terms of the latest technologies and uh, areas that people are looking at. So this payment gateway has been developed through our work, working with the Kisima team, the Capsi team, and uh, we actually are going to go live with this in the next couple of weeks. We've just been delayed uh, primarily because of some regulatory requirements around us having a collection uh, account. And we are working with Trust Africa on that so that all the monetary donations that are made can be pushed to Trust Africa's account and then dispersed to the respective individuals or the respective campaigns that we are tracking. So this is something that uh, we will be monitoring aggressively. We've put up a lot of security systems to manage this so that money cannot be hacked, the system cannot be hacked. So we've got a lot of digital certificates uh, around this. And uh, those guys who are mining crypto or have crypto, there's a way where you can also push your Bitcoins in terms of the donations you can make. Thanks very much, uh, everyone. Over to you. Over there. All right, thank you very much, uh, Oswald. Now, Charles, you will be presenting the theme of the gateway. Focus on is that as as also said, Prof Moyo always pushes us to be you know the lead in the pack. Um, and as you can see, any currency can be used to pay or to donate uh, to any initiative that you choose. And this is what makes it even more special. Now remember that there's different languages as well when you go on this uh, when you go on the when you go on the uh, the site itself. So you can. So the languages that we have on, if you go on the site and you decide that you want to read your story in Isisu, you can do that. It is immediately then translated to Isisu. Mm -hmm. If you decide to go Hausa, there's many other languages that are on. And as we go, 
you will be adding even more languages. Kisima uh, is, a, is, is a sort of Kisabu word itself, and for us, Kisabu as one of the languages that are there. So it is very important to us. What makes it very important is that accessibility becomes an important part of the site, and accessibility becomes uh, an easier way of making sure that everybody can get a hold of the site and understand exactly what is on there. And even as you put your story, you know that even the people in your community can understand it in the language that you are speaking in your community. This is what makes it um, so important. And actually, one of you know the very first to do. So we are quite excited to have this um, on the site. Now, as we move to um, to our next speaker. I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Fritz uh, Bonba, who is a uh, program director He's at Trust Africa, and he will be talking to us about philanthropy and the fiscal sponsorships that we have. But I want, I would also want us to look at um, Trust Africa as their own, providing and giving um, support and a lot of philanthropy work in their life. Um, Fritz, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see an option here to, to share my screen, so I'll just speak because I don't have um, uh, a lot anyway, but if, okay, it's just popped up, so I can project. Uh, let's go. Here we are. Okay, please confirm you can see the projection. Okay. You can? Yeah. All right, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be part of the program. Uh, my name is Briggs Bomba. I serve as the programs director for Trust Africa. We are really excited uh, to be associated uh, with uh, CAPSI and this very cutting edge uh, initiative. Uh, we are really looking forward to seeing it come to uh, full fruition. Uh, we were invited to speak uh, on philanthropy and fiscal sponsorships uh, as part of this inaugural uh, Kisima Kotali uh, dialogue. Um, I will speak uh, more or less in general terms um, because we, we saw that element of sponsorships, fiscal sponsorships. Uh, so I guess uh, not, not you know, very specific to um, this particular initiatives, but very relevant uh, in any case. Um, I'll share a little bit about um, Trust Africa. Uh, and I uh, would like to uh, speak to you um, on just two elements, the te technical side around fiscal sponsorships, as well as what I would like to call the principles uh, side of things. And um, for those who do not know us very well, uh, we are a Pan-African Foundation. We were set up in 2006 with a mission to strengthen African agency uh, in solving the continent's most pressing uh, challenges. Our program areas broadly have been around equitable development, uh, democracy and governance, as well as African philanthropy. The themes that we work on uh, have evolved uh, over the years and continue to evolve uh, because by design, uh, we are meant to work with emergence. Uh, so whatever rises to the top is the most pressing challenges for the continent. Uh, right now, climate is a big issue. Peace and security and governance are big issues. The future um, uh, of work, the future of young people, uh, those are all you know, critical issues. So we uh, 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 implement what we call adaptive uh, programming. We are really looking at emergence and constantly updating our sense of the context and the priorities and the key concerns uh, for the continent. Uh, our main strategies uh, around knowledge building, um, and this is very important, especially for the African context, because most of uh, the knowledge uh, resources that you find out there, especially given our colonial history, uh, is knowledge that is actually very colonial. And uh, so in a sense, uh, we uh, work on decolonizing knowledge and generating knowledge that arises from uh, the specificities of the African context uh, and uh, you know, applying that uh, to critical concerns uh, of the moment. 
uh, we've really found out that you cannot uh, apply knowledge that was generated to work, let's say, with a global north context, uh, and that does not, you know, have uh, that uh, rooting and uh, in the African context. So this is a really critical part uh, of what we do. Uh, we convene uh, different actors, agenda setting convenings, uh, especially looking at how we can then co-create solutions and work together. Uh, we work on grant making, um, usually as a way of connecting big resources uh, and uh, big, you know, good ideas uh, on the other end and looking at how we can get impact out of that. Uh, we invest in strengthening capacity of different actors on the ground, movement building. Uh, so this, these are really the key approaches uh, that, um, you know, that we've implemented. So when I look at what I'm calling the technical side uh, of fiscal sponsorship, uh, we are a 541c3 tax exempt uh, status organization. So this has relevance if you are raising resources, especially in the, in the US. Um, uh, through that uh, status and our fiscal sponsorship, we extend uh, administrative benefits to sponsored charitable initiatives so that they can receive grants and tax deductible contributions uh, that otherwise uh, they would not you know, have been able uh, to, uh, to receive. So we provide uh, opportunities uh, and usually this is to smaller uh, charitable projects to piggy bank on that status uh, and also for them to be able to pass uh, their overhead costs uh, to us uh, as a fiscal sponsor. Um, and beyond that, uh, because we have a full infrastructure in place, uh, we make that available uh, to groups that uh, we you know, provide fiscal sponsorship. And that includes uh, administrative support, uh, it includes grant making, uh, infrastructure. This is very important. Uh, we have uh, in place now, uh, a, a, we use an online grant making uh, system uh, uh, called FLUX, uh, cutting edge uh, allows uh, even to create uh, procedures that allow for you know participatory grant making that allows for um, you know uh, decisions by different organs whether they are steering committees including people who are outside the institution so we have a massive uh, online grant making uh, infrastructure and and it's a one stop uh, space that uh, you manage all the knowledge every email ever extended uh, every document ever shared every approval ever made everything is just stored uh, online and you can just go to a you know particular profile and you'll be able to see all these things uh, in one place all the reports the reminders everything so it's a really massive um uh, and cutting edge uh, uh, grant online grant making infrastructure that we have in place and we provide this offer this uh, you know to initiatives that uh, uh, we fiscal we give fiscal sponsorship to we can also support in terms of helping with accounting office space uh, reporting and the reporting is very critical because all everyone who is giving at the end of the day they really want to know um, you know uh, the impact of their giving uh, and how their resources uh, are being used so all these services are really invaluable especially to new initiatives um, so, so again, through fiscal sponsorships, we, we help institutions bypass the requirements for uh, them to incorporate. And if you are raising resources, especially in the US, to then have to raise a 541c3 uh, you know, status. But even if you are raising resources on the continent, um, we, you know, with our fiscal sponsorship, we help uh, you know, institutions avoid what could be very massive, uh, up, you know, starting up cost or upfront. Uh, cost by just riding uh, on the infrastructure uh, that is uh, already in place. Uh, there's also something that can be said uh, in terms of uh, enabling initiatives that uh, we have a fiscal sponsorship with uh, to uh, benefit from our you know, large network of donors, the experience we have and expertise uh, in raising funds for charitable purposes. Uh, so, so that really uh, helps uh, initiatives to become more effective uh, in their fundraising. Um, also, the, you know, if you avoid all these different uh, pieces, you know, that, that we are talking about, uh, it allows initiatives to then focus resources on the actual charitable purpose uh, that, um, you know, we are setting up for. 
But I think importantly, we can also talk about uh, allowing initiatives to actually uh, go in test mode. Uh, you know, I think we've seen with, uh, uh, you know, with experience now that when you're starting out, uh, in fact, we say, uh, you don't uh, test the water by jumping in with, with both feet, right? So it allows the initiatives to really test out uh, and see the viability, the feasibility, make corrections uh, at the very um, uh, early stages before a massive outlay. So that if you know you are failing uh, or if you are needing to make adjustments, they are not going to be very, uh, very, um, you know, uh, expensive. So you, you won't uh, lose much in terms of time and in terms of resources. So allowing this test. Uh, phase, this test, test stage is very important. And I also wanted to mention something about uh, facilitating collaborations. Um, so with the framework uh, uh, that uh, we provide, it allows for different uh, donors of any size and you know, individual donors to all be able to give, uh, you know, to a central place uh, the way we can, we are then able to disperse uh, those uh, donations uh, to the initiatives, you know, that uh, that will have been uh, identified and also to ensure that the reporting uh, is done uh, in, in a proper manner. So I think those, those, those are important, you know, just in terms of the technical uh, side of things. But I thought it's also very important for us to speak to the principles uh, side of things. And uh, for us, it really starts with uh, alignment, uh, alignment around vision, around uh, values, uh, but also programmatic um, uh, in, a, in, a, you know, in, a, in a big sense. So if you look at our strategy, we are currently in a strategy that we're implementing up to 2024, but our vision is uh, African citizens living with dignity in a sovereign, just and prosperous uh, Africa. So whatever we you know, engage, whatever we engage in terms of fiscal sponsorship, we really want to see that uh, the initiative can fit uh, with uh, this vision, and we're really happy uh, that uh, you know from uh, all the presentations uh, we've listened to from the beginning, you know, from the vice chancellor, from uh, Becky, um, uh, and everyone who's, who's spoken. This is all uh, work for the advancement uh, uh, of our continent, uh, for shaping the future of the continent. So, so we are very excited about that, uh, that alignment and we tick that box. And it's something that we do with all the initiatives uh, that, uh, that we engage and bring on board. Uh, but there's also something that's very important around values, uh, you know, values alignment. When you're talking about giving, um, there's, there's a, 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 a power dynamic that we always have to be uh, alive to. Um, and, and we are um, part of the shifting the power conversations uh, to make sure that those who are receiving are not uh, consigned to this uh, space of powerlessness uh, where they are pitied uh, in, a, in a big sense and they don't really have voice, they don't really have agents. But for us, we're really looking at giving a solidarity. I think uh, in uh, the briefing note we got from Kisima, he talks about Ubuntu. Uh, where we are in Senegal, there's, uh, a, you know, we talk about uh, Nyokobok, where if you give someone something, the response, and, and if they say thank you, the response is like, you know, don't mention it. What I give you is uh, your share uh, uh, of, uh, is your share of what I have. You know, in a sense, that sense of collectiveness, uh, Ubuntu and, and, and collectively, um, you know, being uh, responsible for each other. So this solidarity element uh, has to come in uh, as well. And also making sure that the resources uh, uh, you know, that we are giving are accessible, especially if you are dealing with very local, uh, you know, community-based uh, outfits. There's so many strictures and requirements that can completely exclude um, uh, uh, and make uh, philanthropic resources inaccessible uh, to the people who need them the most. So we try to make sure that our processes, procedures are really uh, uh, informed uh, to be, you know, to be accessible to those, you know, those we need them. If you're working, for example, with social movements, who we all know are at the center uh, of really driving change, uh, they will not have or they will be excluded uh, from a lot of uh, the traditional requirements in philanthropy. So, so our sense is around that in participation, listening, learning uh, from the field, and all continuously adapting 
um, you know, our, our, our processes, our thinking, our programming, uh, based on what we are learning and uh, from our listening and our engagement uh, with the field. And also strengthening the capacity of uh, those that we are giving. I think the purpose of, uh, you know, giving ultimately, uh, you know, is to teach uh, individuals uh, to fish, right? It's not giving fish, but it's to teach to fish so that people are actually able to stand on their own. So we always want to have, a, you know, an eye on that and it can start to uh, inform how you look at um, what you are, you know, what you are giving to, uh, you know, so, so for us, this element of giving that then strengthens capacity is very much uh, important. And, and, and so, I, you know, I speak again around this programmatic uh, alignment uh, being very important uh, for us. So if everything that Kisima is talking about, uh, everything from what Becky spoke about, uh, we can see how it sits in our program priorities, in our mission, in our vision, uh, and in our shaping uh, the future we want uh, for Africa uh, strategy. So let me leave it at that. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Briggs. Uh, and Briggs comes in as part of the director of the GC of Cast Africa, which, which is one of our partners, uh, making sure that we do the work. That we do. In fact, talking about uh, the partners, we have, I think it's important for us to um, just you know, remember and note who we talk to, um, who, who is helping us talk to everybody on a daily basis. Again, I want to just say thank you to our patrons. Let's start there. Uh, our patrons, we've got three. Professor Michelle of Professor Michelle Foundation, uh, John Hensel, who's from Africa CDC, and also Ronnie Judy, Zanini, who is uh, the Vice Chancellor of the University, and also, who also joined us earlier. Also, Open Society Africa Foundations for supporting the research and the development of the, um, of the portal financially and technically. Uh, that's a sister for the overall grant management of the project, Mod Foundation, for supporting the community philanthropy uh, research project that's automatically integrated um, into the Kisima initiative. And Trust Africa for partnering with CAPSI, not just on this project, uh, but on other projects as well. And all CAPSI donors who support, uh, support us to make uh, Kisima integral, the, the Kisima integral work possible. And uh, they are the Ford Foundation, Mod Foundation, Canopy Corporation of New York, Reckitt. Gilead Sciences, APF, APF, EAPM, just to name a few. Just to say a thank you. And again, we will, as, as we continue with the program, it's just a reminder from my side to say we are not, we don't walk this journey by ourselves. We do not walk alone. We walk with uh, the support of those that I've just mentioned now. Now, I'd like to now showcase what we have in terms of the stories that we have online. And we've got joining us. Um, Joining us physically here, uh, we've got Nemai who will be coming on and uh, will be coming through and she will be presenting on the, the foundation that she runs. We've also got Jasmine Sigalani who will be joining us, who will also be presenting on his foundation. And then we'll also be seeing just a video from um, Courageous Kids Foundation and we will be, they are based in Malawi. All the stories are already on the site and as we do more, of um, as we get more of the stories on the site, the, the dialogues that will be coming forth will be getting more stories also being presented. But for now, can I please call on uh, the Maki to join us, please, and then uh, present to us. And uh, we'll start with your presentation first. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Becky. Thank you, Good afternoon, uh, good morning, good day. Uh, my name is Maki Maki Makatu Salapetra, commonly known as Maki. And uh, I'm the founder and the CEO of Kitson City Community Development. And we are based in Acadia in Pretoria. And um, just to tell a short story, because I, I, I learned that this this uh, platform or dialogue is about storytelling. So I, I come from Mafike, and uh, 
you know, this thing of giving, like Mayor Jamin was saying earlier on, is in us, it's in our DNA. So uh, I used to fund children that I didn't know. I had friends who were teachers, principal, and then they just tell me that you know, we've got this child is struggling at school, she cannot pay school fees, she cannot uh, buy uniform, or she's hungry. Then I will do food parcels. I didn't even know what was food parcels. I would just go to this Portuguese food and veg and tell them that can you give me this? I want to give to school or to children. And let me tell you, I have taken those children to school and I don't know them, I don't know their parents. I've never met them, but one day I was sitting with my senior funeral, one girl came to me and said to me, you know, I'm a prosecutor and who paid for my school fees when I was at school, I was in my feeding, I come from a village called so and so. So that is my story. And when I first came to Kauke in Pretoria, coming from my feeding in 1996, I was amazed to see people in the street. And I was like, how can people be lying in the street, sleeping in the street? And then I made it a point to go and see these people and uh, started to ask them, why are they in the streets? Is there a problem? How can I help? And uh, they told me their stories, their stories being, no, I was looking for a job or a, at home, this is what is going on and all that. <clears throat> then I, for two years in my house, in the garage, I cook for them every morning. We will take food to the street before I go to work. And then weekends, I want to sit with them because I want to know why people are sleeping in the street. Believe it or not, I even became a midwife. One woman gave birth in the street, and I helped that woman. I didn't know what I was doing, but I did help that woman. And then uh, later, after two years, we registered Kitoli City. So Kitoli City is a registered non governmental organization established in October 2006, serving unsheltered or a rough. Uh, sleep a homeless population in and around the city of Tsuara. We deliver service directly to the children born in the street, youth, women and men, and without means of income, food, medical care, spiritual care, and shelter. So we never had a shelter. I never wanted a shelter because I didn't understand the concept of a shelter myself. I went to them in the street where they are and give the services that they need there where they are in the street. And uh, as we were growing, uh, this concept of shelter came, but I, I realized that when you give people a shelter, which uh, the city of Swan went into a, a partnership with people in the city to say, here is a building, can you run it? But these people didn't want to be controlled, didn't want to be given conditions. And I said, no, I can't do this. I just want to go to the street and help these people. And what is in the core of my heart is for people to reconcile with their families, rather than keep them there in a shelter somewhere, but they need to reconcile with their families. So what do we do with the programs that we are running at Kitonese? One of the programs is family unification. The second one is drug and substance abuse. As you know that, while people are sleeping in the street and people struggling with their lives, they end up being introduced to drugs. And most of them are, I think 80% of the people living in the street are on drugs. And um, another program is health management. What, what I mean by health management is these people that are in the street, some of them, they have um, relapsed and they are taking chronic medication. The reason being when they go to the, uh, our health institutions, they are called hobos. They are dirty, they are smelling, they, they are not being given services that they're supposed to be getting. And uh, now we have social workers that will take them there to the hospital. And with the help of the community, friends and partners, we do have donation of clothes. And then we make sure that they bath in our ablution block, in our offices, they get clean clothes, and then we can take them to the hospital and manage or uh, uh, administrate their medication to make sure that they take their medication, they get, get the food before they even take the medication. They now know that they can do uh, walk-ins at Kitoli City, and because now they, they have become responsible, they can even come and say, 
that I have to take my medication and I have my meals and all of this. So that's what we are doing. And also the transfer of skills and uh, training. Uh, can we go to the slide of food, especially the baking? That is our sustainable um, baking project. And we use it for the rehabilitated addicts. So these people that are rehabilitated, we give them a skill. Some of them already, they are selling kids in social movement, maculogy, wherever they come from. Then we taught them to bake cakes and then they are able to bake cakes and sell them to the community around where they are living. And we ourselves, we are doing this uh, baking as our sustainable project. We are doing graduates, this concept. If you are able to show those uh, pictures of the the good things that we are doing, and we are also training these uh, rehabilitated addicts when they come from the, the, the rehabilitation, we give them the skill. And not only about baking, but also about food domestic gardens in partnership with the Department of Agriculture, where they are going to be taught about soil testing, doing small gardens in the back of the house. And then as they go home, then we say, by the way, you know that uh, you have learned about the food gardens. Can you go into kimchi? Can you go into spinach? Can you go into tomatoes? Don't just go back home and come back into the big city thinking that you're going to get a job. You don't have a job in the city. Go back home. And then these pictures that you see now is the partnership that we have with the University of Pretoria with their final year student doctors. And also the, the other partnership is with the University of uh, South Africa. Then they, we have uh, social workers that are doing their final year. At the moment, uh, since COVID, and also since COVID, we, we were able to work with the Department of Social Development and the funding to the homeless people that they've been taken out of the street into temporary shelters. And they identify the shelters for us to go and serve the people where they are in those uh, temporary shelters. So we work hard during the COVID, we never closed, we never even rested. And we, we, we still surprised that they are still here because we confronted this um, COVID with our people without fear. And uh, we have them, the women that were mixed with men, we took them out, started to open a temporary women's shelter and children. The men that are not in drugs, especially those that are elderly and sick, took them out of the place where they have all been put together and put them in a place that is safe and take care of them there, but encouraging them every day to say, do you mind if we call your family? Do you mind if we can have the contact of your family so that we can reconcile you with your family? The last, the last time when I was with them, I told them that, you know what, even on your birthday, just tell me the, the contact of your family so that they can call you on your birthday. You would have seen the face changing that somebody from my home is going to call me on my birthday. And because they, they are not keen to go back home because they left poverty at home. They thinking that coming into uh, the big cities, they will be able to get jobs and having big houses. Unfortunately, it's not that. The picture you are looking at is social workers and the <coughs> peer educators. The peer educators are the rehabilitators, rehabilitated addicts that are helping us to give their stories to those that are still struggling to come out of tracks. So, and this is the time of the COVID when we were doing um, the awareness and giving out the, 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 the PPEs and also giving them more water. We managed to get more bottled water to say they are not living in a place where there is a running water. Can we get water for them so that when we see they must be able to take that medication, there must be water there. And this is the the feeding scheme or the feeding program that we have and the people that are cooking there, some of them are our rehabilitated addicts or beneficiaries that came out of the street and we gave them the opportunity to do the work at Kizon City. 
So my story, it, it ends there, it's a lot. I can talk and talk and talk and talk about what is going on. This is the kind of food we give giving them. I always say, you know, good food change the heart of men. So we give them this good food to show them that they are people, not, not because they are in the street, they cannot eat rice and be food, seven colors, they can. And that will change their lives all together. They, and it has changed since 2020 to date, we've been saving them this kind of meals and they can see that they are very important themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, so lucky to see and, and hear the work that you do. I got the pleasure of uh, going to the Kitan City and, and seeing the work that they do. And it's a machine. Now, it is organizations like Kitan City that say to us that if somebody can stand up and say, I can do it, I can help those around me, I can make a difference to those around me, it means a lot because we can all do that. This is the work that we do, and it can be done. It is amazing work. We thank you very much and appreciate it. Can I please introduce our next uh, speaker, Jasmine Sinanami, who is from Fema Water Launch Tech, who has actually won one of our competitions, Aspire Hire, Aspire Hire competition, which uh, was finalized last week. He is the winner of, uh, of that competition uh, with his initiative, and he's going to share with us exactly what they do and how they actually got to win. Thank you, Jasmine. Let me just quickly maybe go to the slide. We are having to point. We might be saying that we are storytellers, so let's just start with our story. Slide page. Right. There's no meaning there, but um, what I can do is I can quickly just go into uh, just to give you guys a high level of what we do from the world of perspective. perspective. Um, we have a four pronged approach, um, this. but before I get into the approach, is what before we came up with, with the program, we, we had to do a research and understand exactly. What we can use in the township. Because the, the challenge was that there's, there's a lot of, for example, that you have an eighth in the space um, in the townships. And there was a challenge within um, Bestwood School and Kiliat and Aspire High to say that how do we throw that? Through? How do we really bring in um, um, education, but also how do we really change the mindset? When we started doing our research, we, we saw that 90% um, of schools in the townships. They have underutilized land. And for us, our first starting point to say that let's how do we then start to use this land to work for us? So, what we've done is we've developed hubs within um, these townships. Uh, our first pilot home is at Tulba Secondary School in, in Zakani, where we've, we've taken the underutilized land, we've used old containers where we refurbished them. And we created a very safe space for, for the kids to really come in and, and really study. Um, if you see up on the first part, we focus on, on the HIV and AIDS, uh, where we, talk, we look at behavior. Um, but also, what's nice of, about our approach is that we, it's also adaptable as well. We know that there are also other social things, <coughs> uh, for example, with teenage pregnancy. Uh, we know that during lockdown, uh, we saw the numbers rising up. And we're able to really come up with initiatives to really deal with that uh, particular aspect uh, from, from, from the heart itself. Um, what we also do is we look at out of school time programs. We, we know that um, if, if you keep a girl at school, uh, their chances of them contracting HIV and AIDS reduces down to 50%. And it goes with other social issues as well uh, in terms of experimenting with drugs, um, alcohol. So what we've said is that let's let's create this out of school time uh, program where when they knock off at school at two, they don't roam around. And I always say that an idle mind is a dead resurrection. So what we do in the hub is that when they knock off at step two, they quickly come into the hub and we've got these structured programs where we do totally, we do homework support, 
and we also have other cultural activities where we begin to debate, just give them an opportunity to then start to express themselves. We also do creative uh, writing. We also launched uh, something a few months ago where we asked um, community members to donate their pinned up books where they brought them into the hub. And now what we have is a very nice book club where um, our kids, when they come to the hub, they're able to really take two or three books and, and want to build that culture of, of reading in the townships. Um, over and above that, we said it needs to be a one-stop shop. We've got these creative and sporting interventions. We said that the land is there, it's underutilized. Let's start to have this um, netball leagues. Let's get the boys to come in and play soccer. Um, let's also bring in gym and, and also boot camps as well. And just make sure that we get um, our, our, our boys and girls to be really uh, connected. But we're using sport also as a draw card as well. We, we know the townships, football is big and netball is big. So what we do is say that don't idle. Coming to the hub, we're not going to bombard you with academics only. We're not going to push you to read a book. But if you really like to play football, it's fine. You can come through here and play football. If you want to play netball, it's fine. If you want to do art, drum as well, this is a safe space for you to come through and do this so that you don't idle. We're very big also on outdoor and adventure interventions. We've seen a couple of slides where we took our girls in December, uh, where we, we had a nice camp, about 30 girls that were part of that uh, uh, intervention, where we also had a very nice um, uh, interaction. But what is important here with weekend programs and school holidays is we want to take them away from their sort of comfortable spaces, especially in the townships, where we want them to explore um, other avenues. When you take them to the camp or we partner with other schools, for example, uh, St. Mary's, for example, when we take them to St. Mary's to the girls where they go, uh, they can have conversations and they're out of that um, normal environment in the township. So we're also very big with that. From a business hub perspective, there's one uh, aspect that we want to be as we move into our into different spaces where we bring in hair salons, nail bars. Here we want to look at the empowerment. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Omar spoke about uh, how do we then get to a space where we teach uh, the, the, the kids to, to fish. Um, and, and I think our program is, is one of those programs where it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a one-stop shop, where we look at behavior change, but also we want to upskill them as, as we move forward. If we look at the next one, the two, um, let's move on forward. Uh, uh, um, this is uh, great. This is the, the, the work that we've done uh, in our pilot where we, we said this is the land in the school actually was underutilized. So what we did is we went and bought all containers, we refurbished them in that space, uh, as you can see on the slides there, the, it's a very nice safe space. You can see there's a nice reading corner there with the bin bags. We wanted to go the approach of, of your likes of Google, where we wanted to, to take a, 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 a class that a very different, very different space where they get in, they are comfortable, they're able to, to really uh, think creatively and also collaborate as well. You'll see um, on the other side, when you come and visit our hub, there's also a collaboration board as well, where they can come and sit, practice math, um, um, uh, debate, um, and do all of these nice things. So we are quite excited. And what's nice about this model is that it's also scalable as well. We are engaging with um, our principals at Toledo's at, at Secondary School, and we will be moving into other townships as well. Uh, to go, go back to go to the next one later. These are some of the quick stats um, in our hub. Um, on an average, we get about 20 learners visiting the hub on a daily basis. So when the school knock off, they, they come to work. We've also seen um, when the beginning of the year, when they had what they call a uh, free period, um, they would come into the hub and just interact with our administrator and maybe be able to, to look at maybe prepare for the next class. What we've also seen is even during uh, break time now, um, they, they, they want to come into the hub and, and just interact. So it's a very nice uh, safe space. On an average, uh, five books are borrowed per week. We want to increase that number, of course, bring that culture of learning. Uh, we do group activities like your net quizzes, we do English spelling bees. Um, we also did, do, do debates as well. So the, the hub is really working for us and we see the kids really coming in, very excited. Let's move on to the next one, Alex. Um, we're very big also on activations. The land is there. And, and why I'm bringing this around activations is that 
we, we also acknowledge that we don't know everything, but what is important with our activities is that we are able to really bring in the right partners. For example, on the 18th of September, we had our, our spring um, activation uh, for the girls where we had Dr. Klale, um, who was able to engage with, with the girls um, and really talk about um, sexual health, we spoke about HIV AIDS and all of these key topics that are really impacting the girls. We also have Krista as well, Aya with also Pastor and Leo Mashir for well. But we believe that uh, as we engage with, with the township kid, we want to look at it holistically, we want to deal with the, the mindset, we want to still deal with the spiritual set, we want to deal with the heart set, also the, and, and the body set as well. As you can see that we also do aerobics, we also do nature, that there's also physical activities as well. Let's move on to the next one. Um, that you just here, this is some of the my, my, my marketing material that we use just as a draw card to bring in the girls to come through into our spaces and this third poster that we use um, just to, to really create the hype and the excitement uh, for the event. And I must say that we, we really had a really great turnout and the girls really enjoyed that themselves. And over the time, this uh, we, we really continue to create and form this um, nice partnership. December, we had a very nice camp, um, at, um, uh, camp uh, discovery, and we will do this on a quarterly basis because we, we believe that um, youth development, uh, if you want to deal with the mindset, it's not just an event, it needs to be continuously. And the hub allows us to, to really continue with these activities. Um, we, we had really nice debates around HIV AIDS, we spoke about um, um, uh, uh, drug abuse, we spoke about a lot of things that we can, but what's nice is it's a, it's a very relaxed environment. And also certain um, aspects or certain initiatives are co-created with the girls as well. So we also give them the voice to say, how do we really assist you um, as, as a girl child? Uh, thanks, Otu. And uh, we are at the, at the end of the, of, of, of the session, we had a nice uh, evening gala dinner. But also what we say to the girls is that as an individual, we are able to, to really show up uh, regardless of your circumstances. We've got girls that are coming from the poorest of the poorest families. And, and we say that, um, uh, whether you come from a poor family, it doesn't really stop you to, to become who you are in, in, in life. So we really encourage them. Um, let's move on to the next one as, as I try and just uh, maybe summarize. Some of the key lessons, as I've said, this is a pilot project. And um, uh, as I mentioned that we receiving um, um, extra seed funding um, just to expand and scale up. And <coughs> some of the key lessons that we've learned is, is really, uh, the first one is a line of project vision the Department of Education in schools. Uh, Dr. Judith Zanini spoke about leadership. And I think it's very important that as we continue collaborating, because we know that the schools are there, the lands are there, but how do we really uh, understand the school governance processes? How do we, who, who are the gatekeepers? Uh, are we speaking with the right people to really collaborate, especially in the township schools, um, roles and responsibilities? Uh, of some of these key stakeholders, the, the SGP uh, and, and so forth. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk on to, to the last one, which I, I think for me is very important, to create opportunities for parents and, and guardian involvement. We, we, we've seen that if we, most of, 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 of the interventions, when we did our research, they focus on the subject, but when they go home, when they leave their hub, they also now go and interact with their parents and their guardians. We need to understand What's that situation? What's happening there? And uh, we want to really get close to the parents and just make sure that they are part <coughs> of the conversation. But also, most importantly, they co create these solutions for us. They understand exactly what are these kids going through and how do we really create uh, systems and processes with the communities to really move uh, forward. Thanks, Lady. Let's move on to, to the next one as, as I'm about to, to summarize. Some of the results and impacts are from a tool as a pilot. Um, from an academic perspective, very important. Um, where from a from a metric results perspective, we've seen an increase from 80 to 82, 88.2% um, um, at, at Tony Lazi. And uh, this was through also our assistance uh, from a tutoring perspective, home support. And, and we hope that uh, next year or this year we'll push to 100 percent Um and, and also we've got about 120 students. From grade eight to grade 12 on the CL Math and Physical Science platform. So we've bought the license 
from uh, from Siavula, and all these kids now get into the platform. They're able to practice math and science, and we try and get as many kids on the platform, which is great uh, for us. Um, from a social social issues perspective, teenage pregnancy has decreased from sixty percent to ninety percent, and we want to push those numbers. Uh, we need to continue to have the conversations. We want to bring in the likes of Dr. Shale. We want to speak with the local uh, social uh, workers within Zakani, uh, just to get in and have these conversations. Um, Lena society has decreased from 10 to 2%. This one we saw, um, especially during COVID, um, where we see a lot of learners uh, committing suicide. So we did uh, specific interventions. We brought in the right stakeholders to start to engage and speak about this particular topic. And that deals with um, the whole uh, mental health uh, conversation. The school managed to eliminate school dropouts. That's great for us. And, and that's that's why we really push the academics because we've seen that for example um the hub um you can come in for an hour or two you do your homework if for example you, you stay next to a, a shibin for example and you can't be able to do your homework because of the noise the hub gives you that platform to come and sit and really uh, study if, if you're struggling our full-time administrator is there and they're able to tutor and assist you in that so that's where now we see a lot of drop out the numbers going down because you're able to do your homework, you're able to come in and really um, uh, push. Uh, Gale absenteeism has decreased from 40 to 13 percent. From a sporting perspective, this excites me. Um, Tornoise, uh, we participated in the St. Andrews Netball Tournament and Tornoise was the first, was the only deaf school that was part of, of that tournament. And then the girls, were, you, can, you can see from their eyes, they're very excited, and, and uh, as I must say that from a performance perspective, there's you still need to do a lot of work there. But for them to, to really experience that um, and, and be able to play, that was very exciting. And we hope our next year will bring in more teams. From a bigger picture perspective, what we're saying, um, colleagues, is that the land is there in all the township schools, 90% have done our research. I grew up in Davidson, um, who was second at the school. Is a big piece of land on the other side. It's underutilized. We want to take these uh, hubs and, and really have these community centers, development hubs in all South African townships, rural areas, and we will be able to even scale it up into other African countries as well. So, this is our story, um, uh, and, and the team. And thank you. Um, I wanted to bring in this last slide from a partnership perspective. Uh, we've got um, over about 20 plus sponsors, partners, partnerships, and friends of the brand as well. And when we talk about impactful giving, um, it doesn't also doesn't have to be monetary as well. For example, if you look at um, one of the sponsors, I'm going to pick on um, Fresh Conversions, for example. These are the guys that did our conversions for the old containers. Um, this, these guys are in the township, they're based in the township. And, and when they heard about their problem, they came to us and said, we've got experience in converting these containers. Let's sit down, let's design. What do you want into the hub? Uh, how do you want to design it? Let's do it together. We collaborated and we did that. That's another impactful giving because they're also coming in, not from a monetary perspective, but also from the assets as well. We've got, um, uh, uh, let me just, uh, Dear Bella, for example, when we, bought to, um, when we went to them, to the December camp, they sponsored us with, with the sanitary pads. So Dear Bella is, is a local sanitary pad um, organization. They gave us sanitary pads uh, for, for the girls. It, it was about, I think for, for each girl, it was about six months uh, supply of, of sanitary pads, which is great. So we, we really uh, appreciate our, our, our partners and the friends of the friends as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jasmine. My name is Jasmine Fumilami, founder of Imbo Water Launch Pad, which stems out from a Class of Child initiative. We are totally at Secondary School, where we've created an out-of-school time program 
we've created uh, this space using underutilized land. We've got these two containers that were old. We refurbished them and we created this very safe space, very creative space for, for the kids. As you enter the hub, you'll see that there's a nice reception area where our administrator will be sitting and interacting with the kids. But what we've also done is we've created a reading corner where kids can be able to sit back in the bin bags, read a nice book, so that we can also build the culture of reading as well in the township. We also have a space where they can collaborate with a whiteboard, where we've got whiteboard markers where they can discuss things and really practice, maybe if they practice mental science, they can use that space. Also have an individual space where Lena can be able to sit and, and really uh, uh, read um, and study, just get ready maybe for an exam for a test. So this space is for the community. We've created this space for everyone to really come through and really benefit from this space. So all the township kids are welcome at Tololua's Secondary School. Look out for the orange containers and sit the child on a more. Thank you very much, uh, Jesslyn and Jesslyn. Now that's the amazing work that you want to see on, on our site. Um, and uh, the next the next video that you're going to see is of Courageous Kids Foundation. And uh, if uh, I'm not sure if Leisha is able to play it right now, it is ready. If you play the video, I will be talking over the video just to tell you that this is a video of the foundation. The foundation is based in rural Malawi. And uh, as, as you go in to understand what they're going through, we had to park, I think we bought a good... 500 meters or at least or around there to get to where they are based. So this is why um, Courageous, who started the foundation herself, could not join us because she was struggling with network on her side. She, Courageous is a 28-year-old lady, young lady who grew up in Malawi and she is an orphan herself and she was a street kid. She was then raised uh, by a family who just took her in and uh, took her to school and raised her. And she says one day as she was walking to school, as she was walking to work um, in Malawi, she, in town, she saw these street kids who were just sitting there and she started saying to herself, if somebody made a difference in her life, maybe it's time for her to make a difference in other people's lives. And that's how the foundation was started. The, what you see there's the little kids, just you know, just the kids that she's taken and uh, taken in. She has about 70 kids that she is taking, that she is helping. And with the help comes, you know, she gets help from her community who, if they've had a good harvest, will share that one of what they've got with her. And that's how she feeds the children. The state will pay for some of the uh, University fees because she's got some of the children that are in, that, that are in university, but essentially she is doing the work. So she was supposed to come also join us to present um, the Courageous Kids Foundation, but she's not able to join us because of major issues on her side. But that brings us to the end of uh, our dialogue and our very first one, the overall um, Kisima dialogue, the introduction of who we are. And the aim we are going forward is to say that we want to have more of these dialogues. We will have these quarterly, um, and these will be held in different parts of the continent, hopefully. Uh, but you can join us from anywhere where you are to be part of this initiative. I would like to say thank you very much for being uh, for joining us and for being part um, of this one. I'd also like to hand over to Professor Betty uh, Moyo just to give us a closing remarks and the way forward. But from me, it is goodbye, and thank you very much for being part of this time. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mapaseka. Let me start by thanking you 
for facilitating the event, uh, but also for coordinating the uh, project. I cannot tell you how inspired I am by the three stories that were told today. Uh, there are many uh, more on the site, but there are several others that we still hope to collect and showcase uh, on the Kisima platform. Uh, I think one of the points that has really come out from this conversation, from the inputs given by uh, Judy Lamini, by Briggs, by the various speakers and the stories themselves is the importance of language in storytelling. And I think one of the things that uh, Mapasega raised is that you can submit or tell your story in your own language. And currently on the site, we have about 13 languages that you can utilize to actually uh, translate the story or to try and read the story in those languages. So we've got English, we've got Americ, we've got Arabic, we've got French, we've got Hausa, Ipo, uh, Malagasy, Portuguese, Shona, uh, Spanish, Swahili, Yoruba, and Zulu, and more others are going to be added. And as far as I know, we are probably the only site that has got this functionality to have as many languages uh, for instant translation of the stories. But the importance is not just in you submitting or telling your own story in your own language. It's also in you being able to understand uh, and read other stories that have been submitted in other languages, but in your own language. Uh, and so a special request that I want to make to everyone out there to actually send us their own stories, uh, especially from other parts of the continent, as you can see, we are currently dominated by stories from South Africa, and that's because we are located in South Africa. But our hope is to cover the entire continent. And so if we could send us your stories, encourage others to do the same, we are going to be able to tell the narrative of the African continent. We are going to be able to showcase the value of storytelling, but also we are going to be able to tell others out there the good work that we are doing, the resilience that our communities are known for. And so, so I really want to um, you know, urge colleagues to help us tell more stories. But there's a second point that I want to emphasize, and this is partly what we do at, at CAPS is to make sure that our programs speak to each other. So what is the importance of Kisima and the stories uh, that we are telling? We see uh, several components to it. The first is that stories will become data for us especially for researchers. Um, it will make it easier for researchers to access this information. Currently, it's very difficult for researchers to access information in different parts of the world, whether it's due to infrastructure, due to language and others, but the Kisima uh, initiative will make it much, much easier for researchers to access this. But we are also a center that is interested, not just in researching and telling the landscape, of philanthropy in the continent and social investment. We are also teaching. And so one of the things that the Kisima initiative, especially the functionalities that it has, does for us, especially for our teaching colleagues, is that lecturers can easily cross-reference while they are teaching. They can easily log onto the site and play a video to demonstrate a point, but they can also use a story as a case study for examination and assessments. So you can see that Kisima is not just about telling stories, but it's got uh, embedded value in it for, for the kind of work that we are doing as CAPSI and through the business school. But it's also important as a way to help decision makers. Uh, how do you take decisions without the stories of the people that you are thinking about or developing policies for? As we are listening to the different stories, it was very clear that decision makers need to be grounded. They need to know what's happening on the ground. And if we don't tell these stories, they are likely to be making policies that are not aligned uh, with what's happening on the ground. So, and finally, to in, we'll also use this opportunity and the Kisima initiative to invite the key drivers of these stories as guest speakers, or what we call professors of practice in our different modules as we teach. So I want to really end by saying that our next stage is to not just um, uh, call for nominations of causes, but is to continually make sure that the collection of stories speaks to the broader concept of developmental transformation in the continent. 
And so the next stage is really about now saying, can you nominate uh, causes that we can support? Can you nominate yourself or be nominated by others? And the criteria will be uploaded on site, uh, especially for those that would want to do so. Uh, but in principle, uh, any organization, any cause qualifies to nominate itself or to be nominated as long as it is doing the kind of work that we listened to. The technicalities around, you know, are you registered? Um, do you have a governance structure in place? Those will be taken care of either through a fiscal sponsorship or through other mechanisms that are in place. And so we would really be interested in, in getting as many stories as possible. Uh, again, I did thank a couple of uh, people for making this happen. I want to reiterate our thanks to uh, the patrons, uh, Dr. Tamini, uh, who is not just the patron, but the chancellor of the university. Uh, I just don't want us to confuse her as the vice chancellor. She is the chancellor. Uh, I also want to thank Mrs. Marshall, Dr. John, but also to thank our partners uh, that have funded the work that we are doing. But I also just did a quick look at some of the participants and I really want to make sure that I, I, I recognize the following. We have been part of this journey, not just Kisima, but the work that caps it does. I remember doing two interviews, um, one with uh, uh, Teresai from the Global Fund for Community Foundations about the value in telling our own stories. And at that point, we had not yet put Kisima in place. We we're just talking about some of the activities that uh, CAPSI will be embarking on in order to change the narrative on philanthropy. And I saw, I see that the Global Fund for Community Foundations uh, is actually represented here by Teresai. And she did an interview and the story for us, which really set the foundation for us to start putting in place mechanisms to implement what we said we we're going to do. We also did an interview with one of our partners, uh, the Philanthropy Circuit, uh, that are doing a good work in terms of communicating various initiatives across the continent on philanthropy. And they've been a good partner for us, um, making sure that they communicate the work that we do, but likewise, we also work with them. Um, I want to recognize Wings. Wings has been also been part of the uh, conversations on, on philanthropy in Africa. Uh, we are about to embark on a project with Wings. Uh, our colleagues from the Center on Strategic Philanthropy uh, at the University of Cambridge, um, they represented, uh, I think, by Dara Kennedy here. I also want to recognize them because we have an MOU with them that helps us to look at philanthropy in emerging markets. Epic Africa um, have been working with us, uh, especially on the impact of COVID on civil society organizations. And last year, we did launch a report that Epic Africa had done in collaboration with CAPSI. I saw Rose and David on the platform. I also want to recognize uh, our colleagues from the Harvard Center for African Studies, uh, who have also partnered with us on various projects, in particular our annual conference on philanthropy. Uh, and of course, I mentioned uh, Trust Africa and, and other groups that are here. So I just wanted to make sure that I really recognize the role that has been played by everyone, including my colleagues, uh, at CAPSI. So from me as well, uh, I want to say thank you, everyone. Uh, we will continue inviting you to some of our projects or all of our projects that we are going to be innovating on. Um, and so thank you, thank you very much. And thank you to Oswald and Charles for being the people that develop these platforms for us. Usually developers don't get the praise that they deserve, but what you see here is not just CAPSI, it's also uh, the great minds that uh, lie behind the development of our platforms. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, and I wish everyone a good day going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bob, and uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon.